Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. To your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Let us pray. Creator God, maker of dancing stars and awesome rainbows, sender of gentle breezes and swirling winds, finder of lost chances and mender of broken dreams, you bless us with beauty and you grace, you grace us with understanding. You know us inside and out. When the heart sighs and grief's too large to carry, you are there. When tears flow like an angry stream, you are there. When doubt snares us like a trap, you are there. When hope dwindles to a thin strand, you are there. You know our comings and our goings. You know when we succeed and when we fail. You know the deepest longings of our hearts. Through it all, your love surrounds us, embraces us, sustains us. In the stillness of this moment, let us abide with Christ in your love who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power Glory forever. Amen. Our psalm from today is taken from Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good from you, apart from you. I 
I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. Lord, you show me the path of fire. Let us now greet each other. Ooh, someone else came in. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody home. Hello, Judy and Betty and Kathleen and everyone else. You may be seated. Hmm? Home. She got up late. A um, few announcements other than in the bulletin. Esther and Rick are in New England this week. They're going to stop by at 12 noon on Tuesday here. If anybody wants to come in, say hello, and exchange, exchange some gossip from Albuquerque um, and have a little, little bit of fellowship with them. I know it's a, a work day, but that, that's the just the schedule that they've got. They, they, they're doing a lot of things while here. Uh, does anybody have anything? Pronouncements? Go ahead. Indeed. There is one craft fair application in the office that came in the mail Friday. I'll get it to you. Okay. Any other prayer concerns? Okay, moving right along. Let us be in a spirit of giving as we give our offerings to the Lord. Our mission this month is one great hour of sharing. Why is love the greatest? Because love is action. Love is resilient. Love is compassionate. Love digs deeper, goes further, reaches higher. Love gives and then gives some more. Love is big and love is small. One Great Hour of Sharing has been putting our love in action all around the world and right here at home for over 70 years. By responding to disasters, feeding the hungry, digging wells for those who lack water, building for those who need shelter, caring for the sick, empowering the marginalized, and equipping those who are ready to change their world in the name of love, God's love. Because when all is said and done, it's love that remains. Put love into action. Give to one great hour of sharing. You can't hide love. It shows up where you least expect it, in places where food is scarce, in the rubble of a disaster's aftermath, where water is hard to come by, where home is a tent in a foreign land, in the middle of a pandemic. Love seeks us out. One great hour of sharing 
has sought to minister to people in need all over the world for more than 70 years. The work we have done behind the scenes responding to disasters, feeding the hungry, providing water to the thirsty, and empowering those who have been marginalized may not make headlines. But eventually, you just can't hide love. Join us in our pursuit to show God's love all over the world. Give to one great hour of sharing. Lord, we read in your word that your truth is greater than riches. We sing that you are greater than silver, more precious than gold, and more beautiful than diamonds. But if we're honest, we realize that we don't really believe that flowery language. We worry about money, we struggle and strain to get it, and we stress over seeing it dwindle away. God, grant us faith faith in you as our provider, faith in you as our true hope, faith in you as the one who meets our needs and who fills our lives with good things. Give us the joy and freedom that is found in a loose hold on the things of this world. May we be cheerful givers, people who are quick to share and happy to lend. In this, as in all things, may you alone receive, receive glory. Amen. O hymn of worship, my faith looks up to thee.
Today, our scripture reading is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and 22 through 28. At that time, it will be said to his people and to Jerusalem, a hot wind comes from me out of the bare heights in the desert toward the daughter of my people, not to winnow or cleanse, a wind too strong for that. Now it is I who speak in judgment against them. For my people are foolish, they do not know me. They are stupid children, they have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to, be, how to do good. I look on the earth, and it was complete chaos, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I look on the mountains, and they are quaking, and all the hills move to and fro. I looked, and there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus said the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolation, yet I will not make a full end. Because of this The earth shall mourn, and the heavens above grow black. For I have spoken, I have purposed, I have not relented, nor will I turn back. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Lindsay. What does this text say? First time reading this, it sounded familiar. It sounded kind of like the Noah story, but on a smaller scale. It has some things in common. Um, But today's reading is part of a larger oracle of judgment against the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem specifically, concerning their abominations and their lack of truth, justice, and uprightness. The prophecy predicts the almost complete destruction of the southern kingdom of Judah and its capital, Jerusalem. The first image the prophet uses is the hot wind, ordinarily used for winnowing grain. In this case, the hot wind is the king of Babylon, who comes to the chosen people neither to winnow nor to cleanse, but to destroy as an agent of divine punishment. The reason for the divinely sanctioned destruction is that the chosen people have become skilled in doing evil. The result is a cataclysmic upheaval of the natural order. The earth becomes waste and void. Earthquake, darkness, barrenness, ruin, and desolation are the natural consequences of Judah's evil. Whether that natural punishment is the result of warfare, as suggested earlier, or natural disaster, is largely immaterial to the prophet's point. Whatever the agency, the result is catastrophic for an agricultural society such as Judah. Today's reading ends on a faint note of hope. The destruction will be widespread and profound, but it won't be absolute. Yet I will not make a full end, says verse 27. A remnant of survivors will remain to rebuild, to replant, and to restore.
Today is September 11th. Let's take a moment of silence to remember first responders and those who lost their lives on that fateful day 21 years ago. God of grace, we want to save the world and yet sometimes we cannot even begin to save ourselves. And so we gather our thoughts during this time of prayer and pray for ourselves. Teach us how to rearrange our lives so that what you would have us do is our first priority. Grant us the courage to release what we desire and firmly grasp what you would have us do. Help us to step outside of our comfort zone in your name. Grant us a willing heart to serve you no matter where we are or what we do. Alert us to the needs of those around us and encourage us to meet that need in love, thereby being the church of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We come as many people, yet gather as one people in this place of prayer. Some of us come with hearts bursting with joy because of a baby's tiny fingers curled around our own. Some of us come in the delight of families coming together for reunions in the summertime, while others of us deal with the ills of family members. Whatever our situation, Lord, we ask for your blessing and especially those, those of us who are unable to, unable to be with us and those who need it most. Lord, bless Scott and be with him through his trials. Bless Joe. And bless everyone else who is in need of your guidance and your grace. Most gracious God, we offer our thanks for the gift of your extravagant love given to us in your Son. Grant us the grace to respond in thanksgiving by living in the power of your love. Help us to extend the hand of forgiveness over and over and again and again that we might love as Jesus loved. Help us to grow in our love for each other and in our relationship with you. Let us not count the cost, but instead revel in the joy as we experience the power of your nurturing and sustaining love. Amen. Let us join together and sing our hymn of petition, Savior, like a shepherd lead us.
Please be seated. Oh, excuse me a minute. Allergies. Today's scripture text is from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who has repents, who, who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls neighbors, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Should we focus on the lone sheep and ignore the rest of the flock? Life is always coming at us. The honk of a car horn from the street outside, a ray of sunlight coming through the window, the smell of perfume in the air, a pinch in the toe from new shoes that are a little too tight, the taste of a cough drop in your mouth. Each of us receives a continuous barrage of sensory information. It comes to us through hearing, sight, smell, touch, and taste. Most of the time, we don't pay attention to every one of these sensory experiences. If we did, we'd be constantly distracted. Instead, we center our attention on certain important elements of our environment. Other things blend into the background or slip by us unnoticed. So, how do we decide what to focus on and what to ignore? Imagine that you're at a party for a friend hosted at a bustling restaurant. Multiple conversations, the clinking of plates and forks, and many other sounds compete for your attention. Out of all of these noises, though, you find yourself able to tune out the irrelevant sounds and focus on the amusing story that your dining partner shares. That's amazing, isn't it? You can focus on what your partner is saying even though the restaurant is full of distracting sounds and smells and sights. This ability to focus on just one aspect of your environment is called selective attention. Preachers want you to practice it every Sunday in church when you concentrate on the sermon instead of a whole range of other distractions. Of course, selective attention is not always needed. 21 years ago today, our attention was riveted on television, images of the Twin Towers in New York City burning and collapsing after being attacked by terrorists. We did not have to be told to concentrate on those images. It was impossible to look at anything else. But most of the time, we must be selective about the things that we focus on. In order to sustain our attention to one event in everyday life, we must filter out the other events. We must be selective in our attention by focusing on some events to the detriment of others. This is because attention is a resource that needs to be distributed to those events that are important. Researchers believe that we can practice selective attention with our eyes 
and ears. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells parables in which a man and a woman practice selective attention in the search for a lost sheep and a lost coin. They both use the spotlight model and the zoom lens model in the spotlight. In this model, visual attention is like a spotlight that enables things to be seen clearly with the center of a small area. Around the focal point of the beam is the fringe, where things are still visible but not very clear. Outside the fringe is the margin, where very little is seen. The woman with the coin uses the spotlight model. Jesus says that she has 10 silver coins, and when she loses one of them, she lights a lamp, sweeps the house, and searches carefully until she finds it. She shines her spotlight into every dark corner of the house, ignoring things that are in the fringe and the margin until the beam of light reflects her coin. Then she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. Zoom in, zoom out. In this model, visual attention is more like a zoom lens of a camera. We can increase or decrease the size of our focus. We can zoom in close on an item of interest. But of course, this means that we must lose sight of those things that are outside of our focus area. If we go the other direction and zoom out, we can see a larger area but run the risk of losing focus on small individual items. The man with the lost sheep uses the zoom lens model. Most days he zooms out so that he can keep an eye on his 100 sheep. But when one sheep becomes lost, he zooms in on that particular sheep until he finds it. When he has found it, Jesus says, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. There is a problem with the zoom lens approach, however. When the man zooms in on the lost sheep, he loses sight of the 99 sheep outside the focus area. And you can imagine that when he throws a party for his friends and neighbors, rejoicing in the finding of the one lost sheep, some of them might ask, why didn't you keep your focus on the 99? Good question. Watching over 99 sheep seems to be much more sensible than zooming in on one. But this is not the approach of Jesus, who wants his followers to practice selective attention. I tell you, says Jesus, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Which myth method should we use? Jesus is all about the spotlight and the zoom lens. He puts at his attention on tax collectors and sinners even though the Pharisees and scribes grumble and complain that he welcomes sinners and eats with them. Just so, I tell you, Jesus says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One sinner, one coin, one sheep. Put the spotlight on the one coin, says Jesus, not the nine. Zoom in on the one sheep, not the 99. Such attention might not seem sensible, but it is central to the mystery and mission of Jesus. So what would it mean for us to practice this kind of selective attention? The selective attention I'm asking you to show me right now and not the beeping car horn, which just stopped. Ah, my prop stopped. We begin by letting go of the bitterness that rises whenever we feel that God is focusing more on others than on us. This was the reason for the grumbling of the Pharisees and the scribes who were upset that Jesus was welcoming tax collectors and scribes, I mean, and sinners and eating with them. Typically, we want mercy for ourselves and justice for others. But these parables call for us to celebrate with God because God has been merciful not only to us, but to others also. We must admit that we want God's zoom lens on us not on the lost sheep. 
We'd like to have God's spotlight on us instead of on some lost coin in the dark, dark corner of the room. But God's selective attention is always on those who are lost rather than those who are found. Our challenge is to rejoice with Jesus whenever a sheep is restored to the fold. We should be thankful that God's mercy has been extended to us as well. After all, every one of us is a recipient of God's unconditional love and unlimited grace. I once was lost, but now am found, says the hymn. Was blind, but now I see. After letting go of our bitterness, we can join Jesus on his ongoing search using the spotlights and zoom lenses available to us. We can put a spotlight on young people. For those who are feeling lost, we can provide a sense of direction. For those who are heading in the wrong direction, we can help with a gentle turn toward God. After all, that is the core meaning of repentance, an about face, a change of heart and mind. At the same time, we can use a zoom lens to focus on adults who might be struggling to find their place in the church after pursuing their careers and raising their families. Yes, there is certainly a need to shine a light on all the adults of the church, but we need to zoom in on those who begin to drift. Both men and women wonder what their purpose is and what their involvement in the church should be like. By zooming in, the church can help people with the challenge of turning around, turning back to God, again, what the Bible calls repentance. Jesus wants us to love everyone just as he does, but at the same time, he challenges us to focus our selective attention on the lost coin, not the nine that are still in hand. He pushes us to go looking for the lost sheep that is wandering around, not the 99 who are safe in the flock. When we do this, we become part of a heavenly party in which everyone can rejoice and celebrate together. Our hymn of benediction, Come We That Love the Lord.
We are Christ's body and individually members of one another. This identity does not cease when we exit these doors and disperse to our individual lives. We are equipped with unique gifts of the spirit, generosity, compassion, leadership, teaching, and countless others. Go forth from this place, committed to use your gifts to the glory of God. Amen. Tuesday, 12 noon, Rick and Esther here.